Well, you've all gone through that process of filing your applications, and you're now all admitted to Bryant. And as Bon Jovi sings, you're halfway there, and you're probably living on a prayer. <laughs> I was so worried earlier in the week because there was a prediction of a foot of snow. So I said, well, I'm going to put some pictures up of how beautiful our campus is uh, during the early spring when the flowers are blooming and students are throwing frisbees. And it's one of the prettiest campuses, not by chance, but because our staffs, both buildings and grounds and faculty and people who live here, students, all work hard to keep our environment a beautiful, manicured, safe, and a place where education is cherished. Several years ago, a parent said to my wife, Katie, as we walked around the campus, I said to my husband, if they take such good care of their facilities and grounds, just think how much better care they'll take of our son. And she's right. We try and take good care of the students that go here. And it's a special place where they learn and live. 99% of our freshmen will live on campus. 89% of our whole student body lives on campus. So that they not only learn in the classroom, but as Maori said, they have enormous opportunities outside the classroom where we believe that academic excellence developed with a vibrant and engaging student life program is critical for them to really mature into the types of individuals who businesses and graduate schools want in their programs. During the past week, uh, I've had a number of interesting and exciting things for me occur. Uh, last week on Friday, we were honoring our distinguished alumnus and our alums who have made significant contributions in the community and to Bryant. And one of our alums from Silicon Valley was sitting at my table, across the table, and he said to the gentleman on my left, he said, you look familiar. Now this is a guy who had created a num number of startup uh, companies out of Silicon Valley. He worked directly with Meg uh, Whitman in eBay in, in generating that uh, magnificent company. And he said to this person on my left, he said, you know, you look familiar. Have, have we worked together in any of my uh, operations? And the young fellow, Anthony, said, I don't think so. I'm a junior at Bryant. And he said, wow, you really looked very uh, sophisticated and older. And he said, so what do you do at Bryant? And he said, well, I'm the CEO of the CEO organization, and we were just chosen as the best CEO organization in the country last, this past year. And I just last week was on the tax team that participated in the PricewaterhouseCooper National Tax Challenge, and we came in second in the nation ahead of Berkeley, UNC, Michigan, Houston, Illinois. And he said, I'm really disappointed we weren't number one, but with that kind of company, we came behind BYU. He said, it was a great, great competition. And I couldn't have been prouder of here is one of our students talking to one of our successful alums about how successful he has been here at Bryant. And then just two days ago, I received a message that our international team participated in a national contest and they were rated the top international business team in the country. And on th Thursday of this week, I was in Washington. I'm sorry, I was in New York. And uh, we had an alumni meeting. And to see many of the students, because as Katie said, I've been here 15 years, to see many of the students who I knew when they were students, who have gone to New York, from Wall Street to corporate headquarters, and to talk to them about their exciting careers was just a thrill. I left there walking a foot above the ground. So today I want to share with you, as Terry and Maori have, why I think Bryant is really a very special place, and why I've spent the last 15 years of my life here, and why I hope to be you're present for your four years here. We live on campus with 
Dr. Tom Aiken and Dr. Jose Marie Griffiths. And this is really almost like a family. We've got our dog, so if you have to leave your dog behind, you could uh, be with Tupper. And uh, as Lorna said, you parents know that this is a somewhat scary time, particularly if it's your first or maybe your only child, because they're going away and you've worked hard up until this moment to make sure that they go to the right college and get the right education in a safe environment, which is going to continue the maturing process which you have developed. But as she said, don't worry. I guarantee you, it has been our experience, and I bet it will be yours, that after they come here, this generation comes back and lives with you again. So it is not the final farewell. And the harder they say before they leave you, I will never come back and live with you again, it's like the boomerang. That's the harder they hit you when they come back. So rather than me just talk about Bryant, I want to talk about something that I think is important. And Maori, in her talk this morning, discussed it. And it's a very important question which we are going to ask every freshman and throughout all of your four years. And the question is a simple one. What is your passion? Because we believe that if you can articulate your passion, you will be more successful in your life than you can possibly imagine. And how will you make a difference? How will you follow that passion and make a difference in your career, and in your community, and in your life? Uh, will you own your own company and be such an innovator that you're going to transform people's lives in that company? Will you be like Ken Oranger, who's a Bryan alum in the class of 1987? He knew he wanted to be a chef, but he came to Bryant because he said, I knew I also had to have the business background to be successful in my passion. So I combined an accounting background with my passion for cooking. And if you go to Boston and go into one of his six restaurants up there, Cleo, you'll find out what passion's all about and have a great dinner. Will you earn enough money to have your own philanthropic foundation to give back to the community? Will you have the chance to engage in nonprofit work and be the leader of a hospital? Will you get an accounting degree and go to law school and get elected as an official, either in your town or in your state? Maybe you'll be a governor and try and develop and bring back a civil discourse into the public dialogue. Will you raise a family and because of your love of literature, perhaps from Terry's class, will you read to your kids every night and make sure that they have a wealth of experience? These are the things that we want you to do to have that passion, to make a difference, to be a leader in the world. And that's what Bryant is all about. We'll ask you that first year to write down your passion. Because unless you write it down, I really think it's just daydreaming. You've got to, it's hard work to think about what your passion is, to write it down. And then we'll ask you to develop a career path and focus on choosing courses in both the College of Business and the College of Arts and Science, which will help to put you on the glide path to finding a life where you can live out your passion. It's really creating your own personal business plan. I don't think there's another college, frankly, in the country that goes through this innovation of helping you to find your success. I have so many friends whose kids come home after four years and they then say to their parents, now what am I going to do? We're not going to let you get to that end of the game without thinking about it. We're going to ask you, as we ask Maori and so many other students, to talk about that very early. Our mission is simple. We want to make you a global leader, someone who demonstrates character and makes a difference in your world because you've had the advantage of an excellent academic education here at Bryant. And we are like no other university in the country in that regard. We've just completed our strategic plan called Vision 2020. And in that plan, which is for the next 10 years as we visualize where we want to go, we're also visualizing what your world will be like, what skills and qualities and ideas you'll need to have in order to be successful in that world. And it's an innovative 
I believe, bold and challenging plan that's going to not only take Bryant to the next level, but it's going to give you the skills to really stand out in your career over the next 40 or 50 years. The first part of that, there's four Bs, and this way you can remember it, is beyond the boundaries of the disciplines. And Dr. Hassler talked about that, how we combine the best of our College of Business with the best of our College of Arts and Science and give you integration so that you have the ability to use your left and right side of the mind to be successful. We want you to learn about history, which is the predictor of future successes and failures, so that in your business, you'll understand what you should and should not do. We want you to be able to write and to speak and to have an appreciation for music, because when you become the senior officers in your company, we want you to be the leaders in your community in these nonprofit organizations. And if you're in the social services, if you're going to be a lawyer, if you're going to be in psychology or sociology or healthcare, we also want you to have an appreciation for a balance statement. We don't want you to just have an entry level position. We want you to run the nonprofit. We want you to run the hospital. We want you to set up a no nonprofit organization that literally makes a difference and changes the world. We want you to have a social entrepreneurship if you're an arts and science. And we want you to have an entrepreneurship ability that has a social conscience if you're in the business world. The world is changing, and it's changing faster than we can probably appreciate. And what we're trying to do is keep up with that change. And so the second B, the first one is beyond the boundaries of the disciplines. The second one is that we want you to go beyond the boundaries of the book. We have technology here which embeds the ability to communicate with people around the world, and even your parents. I like to tell the freshmen at this event, you can even sit in a tree because we're totally wireless and Skype home to your parents for money. <laughs> Our new Center for Innovative Programs is going to be one of, I think, the most exciting new initiatives of our strategic plan. We're going to, in your four years, build a new academic building, not like anything that's ever been built before because we have a team of architects looking around the country to figure out how do we take innovative learning interdisciplinary programs and teach them in very flexible space. Not just a space that sits 30 or one that sits 80, but one which is going to use enormous amounts of technology, enormous amounts of, of screens and boards to write and keep things on, that's open 24-7 where students are working with faculty on projects and in teams and with alumni and business people. It's an exciting, exciting time that you're going to be involved in. But we will teach you not only how to learn from the books and the text, but you'll be in groups. As a freshman class, we're going to put you into a, what we're going to call a deep dive scenario. We're going to try and help you initially your freshman year, after you've sort of thought about your passion, to think about what are the skills, qualities, and leadership characteristics that you need, and you'll be working in groups of 25 to 30 with an alumni, a faculty, a staff member, and a business person to do business plans, to do uh, community service projects. We're going to bring your class back one week before the January period when the rest of the students come back. You're going to have class activity, so you form a strong class. The class of 2015 will be one of our best classes graduating from Bryant. You'll be doing a case study on climbing Mount Everest. You'll figure out how to form your team, what equipment you need, how long it's going to take, what the altitude process is to make sure that you're climatized to get to the top. And then we're going to bring in a woman who formed her own team, and she's going to tell you what they did and how they didn't make it to the top on their first try and why and you'll have a chance to validate what you think. In this class is an applicant who we hope will come, who already climbed to Mount Everest himself, and we'll give him the chance to talk about his experience. And you ask parents, does a Bryant education pay off? And I want to tell you, it pays off better than any other investment that I know in higher education. Because during the last three years, when we have had the worst economy since 1929, 96 to 97% on average 
during these three years of our students like Maori have had a job within six months. We track every student. And so we know based on 89%, have a job within six months with the average starting salary of $50,000. That is not just an entry level job at some <laughs> dairy mart. And I think it's because companies, CEOs have told me they like our product. Our kids are smart, they're caring, they're ambitious, they're focused, and they're ready to go to work the day they leave, just like Maori and many others. And as a student-centered community, Dr. Tom Aiken and his staff do a wonderful job. There's over 80 organizations. We want you to practice your leadership skills. We want you to get involved, not just sit in your dorm. Uh, the kids come here with better TVs than I have, better iPads, iPods, all sorts of technology. We want you out of the dorm. We want you to engage with other organizations. If you go to any college, promise yourself you'll do two things. One, you'll get to know a faculty member. Here, we want you to know at least one faculty member really well so that they'll encourage you to follow up on your ideas and your passion. Second, that you'll join one organization outside the classroom that is going to reinforce what we teach in the classroom. We hope that when you come here, you'll find that the world is where you're going to be playing and that you'll, despite perhaps some hesitation to go beyond the borders of your town, your state, or this country, find that you're going to go out and engage in either the sophomore international experience or some other international experience. And that's the third B. It's you've got to go beyond the borders of where we live to find out what's going on out there in the world. I go to China at least once a year. I go to South America. I'm out there. I've traveled around the world. I know what's going on. And it's hard to just convey to a student unless you go there. So we have these programs that will help you to get there. By 2020, we want 100%. Everyone in your class is going to have a serious academic experience. If you don't go, you're going to really immerse yourself in something that's going to help you to understand what's going on in the world around you. This is critical. And one of the ways we're going to help you if you're interested in China. For three years, we've been working on getting an exact replica of the Forbidden City built in China. They're going to start it this May. It's going to take them a year. They're going to containerize it, ship it over here, and in 2012, they're going to build it right behind our campus. Some schools teach Mandarin in just an ordinary American classroom. We're going to teach it in an authentic classroom where understanding the culture of China is as important as being able to say ni hao. This will be the first time in the history of China they've ever done this. Uh, we're thrilled that it's going to happen on our campus. But it's just the beginning of how we're going to try and internationalize you with experiences on our campus about the world that's going to be around you. And the final B is, as has been alluded to, we want to take you beyond the basics. It's not good enough in today's world to have just a good education, to make a lot of money. You've got to have character. It's important for our country. It's important for your company. It's important for you to develop a true north. We want you to be thinking about, and it's a journey that goes throughout life, how to make hard choices when it's easy to have a mental lapse, how to persevere when you have financial or personal challenges and perseverance may be the only thing that will get you through a difficult situation. As Katie said, how to understand self-management, respect for others in a pluralistic society, how to have ethics and responsibility, and how to make sure that you take full responsibility for your actions. These are things that we try and imbue within every student, and it's, I think, a reason why companies like our students, because they know they're not only smart, but they've got what we call as the character of success. So let me go back to where I started. Whether you come to Bryant or whether you go to another school, do yourself a favor and try and focus on your passion. I see so many people, I've seen them in my life, 
They go to work and they, they really don't like their job. They don't like what they're doing. If you can find your passion, you will be wildly successful beyond what you can possibly imagine. I like to end these talks and people who've been here before maybe sometimes get tired of hearing about my odyssey to find my passion. But I grew up uh, in a small coal mine, steel mill town in western Pennsylvania, Johnstown. And as I was a high school senior, I never could have imagined that someday I would be a university president. Nor could I have ever imagined that I would marry this cute girl who was two years behind me in the same high school. But both have happened. I didn't go to a single admitted student open house. Neither of my parents had gone to college. In fact, none of my friends had their parents who had went to college. Uh, the only people I knew who had gone to college were the doctor and clergy in our town, teachers. And <clears throat> I had decided that my passion was going to be to go into medicine. And I wanted to go to Dartmouth. And I said to my father, because there, there were five kids in my family, two had already gone off to school, I'd like to go to Dartmouth. And I remember him asking me, how much does it cost? And I said, uh, I think it's around $5,000 a year. And that may seem like a little amount today, but in those days, it was a lot. And he said, we don't have $5,000. We've got your brother and sisters already in school, and I, I don't know how we could do that. He didn't know anything about scholarships or financial aid in those days. And, and so I didn't apply. And I started exploring, OK, how could I get a college education which is going to be paid for itself? And I saw, I remember a friend of mine telling me, you could go to the service academies for free. And so I applied, and my congressman appointed me, and I went to Annapolis. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. Must be an Annapolis grad out there. <laughs> and after my plebe year, I went in to see my faculty advisor. And he said, what are you going to major in? And I said, well, I'm here for pre-med. He said, we don't have pre-med here. <laughs> At Annapolis. And he said, we have engineering. What engineering do you want to major in? <laughs> and I said, OK, sign me up. Because I didn't have an option. And I had to just change what I thought I was going to do. And I wasn't sure. But during my four years, I, I, I developed a passion for the Navy. And I thought, I'm going to become an admiral. I'm going to spend a career in the Navy. And so I graduated. I had the uh, privilege of being selected as the one midshipman who stayed behind to work for the commandant uh, for eight months, and then uh, I went out and joined the Navy and the surface fleet. And this was during Vietnam, and it was a tough period, as many of your parents know. And I would read what was going on, and my friends who went to civilian schools were constantly attacking the military. The government was uh, adverse to what was going on. And one night, somewhere out in the Mediterranean, close to my fifth year of obligation, I said, you know, I'm going to get out of the Navy. Although I enjoyed it, I said, I'm going to get out, and I want to have a passion to go to Washington, get elected as a congressman, and try and change what I saw going on in Vietnam. And the only way I knew to do that was to go to law school. We had one child. We were married. But with my wife's encouragement, I left the Navy on one day, rolled in law school the next day. It was hard. We were. Uh, looking under the car seats for change. Uh, it was not an easy transition, but Katie worked. Uh, I worked part-time. We made it through. And I was admitted to the bar, and I started practicing law. And the next thing I knew, I'd been practicing law for 10 years. And I had what my family had hoped for. I had a BMW. I had two kids. I had a dog. We had a new house. Life was good, but I had never followed up on my passion. And I was thinking that maybe someday I'd do it when the timing was right. And I went to a friend's house who was a Marine colonel who was at the Naval War College in Newport. And I said, you know, I really don't believe that my congressman is a particularly uh, uh, good member of Congress. And I had uh, thought maybe I'd run for Congress when I got out of the Navy. But you know, I, I'm not sure that it's worth it right now. I'm doing well. And he said to me, he said, you know, Ron, he said, I'm making a lot less money than you. He said, I've been involved in conflict all over the world, as have many of your classmates. 
And if you can't just give up something to follow your passion to try and make this country better, you, you forgot everything we learned. I said, you're right. And so with a few friends and, my Katie, and Katie's help, we said, we're going to run for Congress. Had never run for office before. And at the end, uh, she said it will take a miracle, and it probably did take a miracle. But I was elected to Congress and beat a 28-year incumbent and went to a congressman's office for the first time, which was my office. And I spent six years in Washington. I thought, I have found my passion now. I'm doing some great things and meeting great leaders. But I was a six-year geographic bachelor, living in Washington with my family up here. And I changed, and I said, I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing that. And so I, I didn't know what else to do, and I ran for governor. But I really didn't have a passion to do that job, but I, I couldn't figure out how to come back home. And, and despite the polls showing that I'd win, I lost in a primary, and I didn't know what I would do for the rest of my life. I thought maybe I'd, and, and some of you parents may have hit, maybe I've already hit the high point in my life, and the rest of my life will just be doing meaningless work. Throughout this entire period of time, I'd always taught. I really liked to teach, and I, but I never thought of it as a profession and a passion. And I taught a course right here at Bryant with the then president. And he called me up and said, Ron, I'm leaving Bryant. Would you have any interest in being President Bryant? And I said, I don't think they want a recovering lawyer and a former politician. I don't think that's probably where they're going. But it worked out. And I came here. And I realized when I got here from almost the first day that what I had been doing was really my true passion. And it's now the greatest passion I have is to help you as students find your passion, to help you to be the leaders who are going to take the United States to the next level, to help you to develop character to become the family leaders who are going to help your children to succeed. When I was at Annapolis, sitting in chairs like this, the very first day getting sworn in, the superintendent, I remember it vividly, said, look to your left, look to your right, only one of you are going to graduate. And it was true. And I always thought that was a not particularly appropriate thing to say. And I like to say to a group like this, look to your left and look to your right. One of you will be the president of a company. One of you may start your own company. One of you will be the chairman of the board of your local hospital. One of you will create a great social change. One of you may be sitting next to your future spouse. Everybody's le looking left and right to see who that might be. <laughs> but all of you can become Bryan alumni if you choose to come here and make a significant difference as a leader in this world. Good luck, and I hope you enjoy your day. Bye.